So are you dealing with foot and ankle issues? Are you dealing with plantar fasciitis? So foot and ankle injuries can perhaps be some of the most debilitating injuries out there. So not only do they shut you down from running, they also can shut you down from being able to function in your regular daily activities. They can also take a long time to get over as you have likely experienced. But here is the great news. They do not need to. So many runners use band-aids to fix their foot and ankle injuries, whether it's changing shoes, purchasing orthotics, icing, stretching, and all sorts of fads out there. And if you've done some strengthening, it often hasn't worked either because you most likely are strengthening the wrong areas. So does this sound like a familiar story to you? So it's Monday night, which means it's Monday night, Spark Live, and we are live within the Healthy Runner Facebook group doing a live Healthy Runner podcast interview. In this episode, we are going to be covering what is plantar fasciitis? How do you know if you have plantar fasciitis? So what are the symptoms, right? What causes it? How do you get rid of plantar fasciitis? So what is the treatment? And what is the best exercises for plantar fasciitis? And then how do we prevent it from starting or coming back? So I will share with you in this episode the SPARK method in which I will, sh I will share with you five actionable tips to get rid of your plantar fasciitis and keep it from coming back. So those of you who are jumping here on the live, just let me know you're here. Type in live into the comment box. And those of you catching the replay, type in hashtag team replay. Let me know that you watched it. And I do want to welcome some Instagram friends. Um, I am giving you a little behind the scenes peek here on Instagram. So if you're here on Instagram, then feel free to write in any of your questions into the comment box. I will try to get to your questions as well tonight. So Lou's here on the live, or is here on the live. Diane, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And Coach Cat is here on the live. So I am going to get started with our dynamic warm up. So by the way, guys, um, our dynamic warm up, it's kind of the intro to the show, but I don't know if you saw the dynamic warm up video that I added in YouTube three weeks ago. It is gaining traction. So believe it or not, I just checked this today. I have 258 videos uploaded on the Spark Your Training YouTube channel at getting you healthy as a runner and keeping you healthy, as well as all the Healthy Runner podcast are there in video form right on Spark Your Training uh, YouTube channel. But out of the 258 videos, the dynamic warm up, the five minute warm up for runners to perform before they go for their run is gaining traction. It has the fourth highest views and it's only been out for three weeks now. So it has over 600 views and seems to be very helpful and is resonating with a lot of runners uh, based upon everyone's comments. And so if you haven't checked out this video yet, I highly recommend that you check out the video. So if you're here on Facebook, just comment five minute warm up in the comment box and I will drop that link for you. So you can check out that warm up video to kind of prime your body before your next run. Um, if you're listening to this on the podcast, then just click the link in the show notes, which will take you to the video on YouTube. So my dynamic warm up, who I am, where am I from? For those of you new, to the Healthy Runner community. I'm Dr. Dwayne Scotty. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a physical therapy educator, researcher, running coach, and creator of Spark Physical Therapy, where we help active adults be able to run without aches and pains so you can feel good about yourself again, even if you don't think you're a runner. So either I help runners through virtual telehealth services or in-person services right here at my clinic at Multisports Academy, Jim, the greater New Haven, Connecticut region, um, which is basically servicing the couch to 5K runner as well as the experienced marathoner. So can I just say, as you guys are coming on here on the live here, I see Kathy's here. Kathy, glad that you caught it. Uh, Jean's here on the live. Laura's here. Carly's here. Carly, I'm glad you made it as well. I think today is going to be very helpful for you. Uh, 
L- Lou wants uh, to make the ankle great again. <laughs> Uh, so he wants to make his ankle great again. All right. So Trish is here on the live. I think you're doing double duty here, Trish. Awesome. Uh, here on Facebook and Instagram. I love it. Um, so Andre, I will get you the five minute warm up uh, link. Um, if for some reason, Lou, you can find that quickly and want to drop that, I would greatly appreciate it. If not, um, I will get it to you after I am done here, Andre. Um, so by the way, guys, I am super, super grateful and thankful to our Healthy Runner community. So the podcast had its first 5,000 download month in October after being in the 4,000 range. So we have 4K downloads per month in August and September. So the podcast is gaining some traction. So I'm super excited um, as the show passed 24,000 downloads all time since we started last March. And I can't tell you how much that means to me because this just started as a little passion project of mine and I didn't know really what it would turn into and, you know, if it would gain some traction and it seems to be resonating with a lot of runners out there. And clearly you like some of the guests that I brought on the podcast and, you know, I'm here to deliver as best kind of running health content for you, whether it's like tonight, we're going to do a deep dive into foot and ankle pain, plantar fasciitis, or if I bring on a guest. So I have a bunch of plans. I have a bunch of scheduling hardcore um, this last week. So just to give you a little heads up, guys, next week, I do have another um, special guest. So I have uh, Dr. Gene Techmeister coming on and he's actually going to answer the age old question, which I'm sure you've heard before. So is running bad for your knees? So we're going to actually get into that. Dr. Techmeister is a physiatrist. He's assistant professor of clinical orthopedic surgery at Kenk uh, Medicine uh, at USC. And he specializes in non-operative care and sports medicine injuries. So he's going to really kind of get into if you've been running for a long time and you are worried or you're scared that you're going to develop arthritis or for you new runners who you're wondering or maybe you haven't gotten back into running because maybe you had knee pain and you thought, you know what? I can't get back into running because running is going to be bad for my knees and it's going to bring me knee pain. So we're going to get into that next week. Um, I also have some other great guests lined up. So some of the topics that we're going to be hearing about these next couple of weeks is how do you loosen tight muscles? So tune into that episode running through winter. So I've gotten a lot of questions about how do we stay motivated through winter? We're going to bring on Coach Mary Johnson. She's going to come on, talk to us. How do we run through winter as well as COVID-19? And then we're going to bring on two colleagues of mine, highly respected colleagues, buddies of mine, um, Dr. Jay Meyerson and Dr. Jay Grimes to really talk about why do I hurt? We're going to talk about pain explained for runners. So we're going to get in depth into what is pain and why do we hurt? And I think that's going to be a super valuable episode with two great guys. Um, Like I said, very close friends of mine, but very, very talented educators um, in the physical therapy field. So I am very lucky to have them come on the show and share their knowledge with our running community. So you guys can always check out what is coming on next. These are like the coming attractions. If in the Healthy Runner group, you go to uh, events, go to the events tab, and you will be able to find the coming attractions for future episodes all right, guys. So I see uh, Matt. Thank you for jumping on here on the live. I'm gl- gra- glad you made it. And so I'm going to start this off. Let's start this episode off with telling you a little story about a runner I know. Is that okay? Hopefully that's okay with you. I'm going to be a little story time with Dr. Scotty right now. Um, so this runner is actually 39 years old and they're middle-aged, and they started feeling some soreness when they took their first step out of bed in the morning one day. However, after a couple of steps, it would loosen up. So as each day passed, they noticed that it took longer to loosen up. Um, They run four to five times a week and would feel some discomfort and pain the first half mile of their run, and then the pain would go away. So then they noticed it felt tight when they try to stretch their foot, And they started feeling pain when they would be on their feet all day standing because now we're all on Zoom, we're all on computers, and they got a standing desk. So they're standing most of the day and because they can't sit because then their back would hurt if they sit too long. So now they're standing most of the day. 
And they also notice that when they go for walks with their spouse or any length of time, like walking the dog, um, their foot starts to hurt. And they also notice that it's, it's painful after they would sit for an extended period of time. So say like watching, you know, Ozark on Netflix or watching an episode um, on Netflix, they would feel when they go to stand up, it feels like stiff and it feels painful, kind of in the heel area, in the arch area area and they're really noticing now that they, when they go for a run that it's it's now taking a mile for that like stiffness and pain to subside and then they're fine during their run but now their long runs are starting to get a little bit shorter so they're starting to feel some of that pain come back at like mile seven eight and you know they're having more of that pain after their runs so has this happened to you Does this story resonate with you? Do you know who this runner was? So spoiler spoiler alert, it was this guy, right? So that was actually my story. And that is the story that I hear very often. And I share this with you because I not only help runners stay healthy, but I am also a runner too and have felt many of the aches and pains that you have felt before. And I know what you're feeling and I know how frustrating this type of foot pain can be. So that is going to be and shape the conversation for today because what I'm going to be doing in this episode is breaking down the causes, the treatment and the prevention of plantar fasciitis or heel pain in runners. So those of you who are here on the live, let me know to learn a little bit about plantar fasciitis. I got my anatomy models out. We're going anatomy style. And I just want to give a little shout out to Jen who jumped here on the live. Lou, you're the man. Thank you so much for dropping that link. I appreciate it. And um, Gene says, I keep going back to the five-minute warm-up before every run. I think it almost... <laughs> I almost have it down by now. Awesome, Gene. Yes, it definitely takes me a while as well. I do the same thing, honestly. I'll YouTube different um, exercises, give them a whirl, try them out myself. I always obviously try everything out before I recommend it to you guys. So I'm glad that you're getting the program down and I'm glad that it's been helpful. Trisha says, you know me, I couldn't find the Facebook Live at first, but saw it on Instagram. So I came back to Facebook. Yeah. Yes, uh, Trish, yeah, I got uh, Instagram going. So those of you who are here on Instagram, let me know uh, that you're here. Uh, how do you guys? And hopefully you are enjoying this live podcast episode. And if you haven't checked out, check out the Healthy Runner podcast wherever you get your podcast because you'll get great content like this. Um, so Andre says thanks. Uh, Trisha says um, that she's here. All right. So, oh, or Trisha knew that was me. Nice, Trisha. I'm glad that you realized that that was me. That was when I was 39. So that's that's going back like two years now. All right, guys. So let's get into what is plantar fasciitis. So plantar fasciitis is one of the most common causes of heel pain. The plantar fascia, here we go, anatomy style. So guys, uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you're going to want to check out the YouTube video version of this or just go in the Healthy Runner Facebook group, join our group, and be able to see the video version because I'm going to point out some anatomy as I go here. So the plantar fascia is actually a thick web-like ligament that runs on the bottom of the foot here. So it's this kind of ligament. So it's like connective tissue ligament. It's hard. It's not a muscle. And it really connects the back of your heel all the way to the front of the foot. So kind of what we call the forefoot. And it actually connects into the first toe and is stretched when you flex your first toe or when you bend that first toe. And the fascia acts to actually... Um, protect the bottom of your foot. It acts as a shock absorber. So it absorbs and supports the arch of your foot, helping you walk and run, of course. Uh, So plantar fasciitis is one of the most common orthopedic complaints. Your plantar fascia ligaments experience a lot of wear and tear in your daily life. So if there's too much pressure on your feet, you can cause damage And you can cause either micro tears or in severe cases, tears of this ligament. So if the plantar fascia at its connection point here at the heel becomes inflamed and the inflammation causes heel pain and stiffness. 
So the cause of plantar fasciitis discomfort is still unclear or unknown, but research does suggest that this condition may involve more degenerative changes as opposed to inflammation. Like if you were to roll your ankle, you sprain your ankle, and there's some swelling, there's some inflammation on the outside part of your ankle, you know that's swollen, right? This is a little bit different. It And the research suggests this, that it's more degenerative because the, the fascia is actually starting to wear away and starts to have some changes within the tissue as opposed to inflammation. So some say that a better name for this is actually plantar fasciosis or some people just call it plantar heel. Know it as plantar fasciitis. So that's how I am going to refer to it, even though there is some discrepancy now in the literature and what exactly is going on in the actual tissue and whether or not there is inflammation because typically itis means inflammation. So, but I will refer to it for simplicity purposes as plantar fasciitis. All right. So the other thing is that fascia actually connects to this heel bone. So here's your foot and here's your heel bone. So your heel bones, your calcaneus, we have this little bump right on the bottom of the calcaneus that is called the medial calcaneal tubercle. And what attaches there is that plantar fascia. And this is the site that gets irritated. And this is the site that you get localized pain over. So if you're getting pain right on the inside part of your heel, then most likely this is plantar fasciitis. So obviously this is to be said, but I will say it. Um, This is not meant to diagnose any of you guys. This is giving you the most common scenario in which we see in clinical practice. However, you should see a medical practitioner to fully rule out and rule in that you do in fact have plantar fasciitis. There are other conditions that are more rare, nerve injuries that can happen down here, as well as referred pain from your lumbar spine can cause pain, believe it or not, down at your heel. So I would recommend a good medical screening and a good evaluation by a good running physical therapist to fully diagnose your condition. But let's move on with today's episode is the fascia connects right to this bone. So has anyone heard, you guys who are here on the live, have you guys heard about uh, bone spurs before? I'm just curious. Has anyone heard about bone spurs? Um, I want to know if you've heard about bone spurs. And the other thing that I didn't mention is if you have any questions at all, I know a couple of you folks um, responded to my post, my little promo post about tonight's, and you commented that you do have foot pain. So this is your chance. You guys got me live. Um, ask any of your foot and ankle questions in the comment box, and I will answer you. All right. So Noella, thank you so much for joining. You are suffering from plantar fasciitis right now. Okay. So hopefully this episode is going to be helpful for you and please drop any questions that you have along the way. I'll be happy to clarify, um, with any of the content that we are going over today. So have you guys heard of heel spurs? So Kat says she has heard of heel spurs. Matt says he's heard of heel spurs. Um, Carly says she's heard of heel spurs. Okay. So what are heel spurs? First off, heel spurs are going to be this bone is a bone. And when the fascia starts to get irritated, that fascia pulls at the bone, forming extra bone. So the body starts to heal itself by throwing down extra bone. So our body, we call this Wolf's Law. It's kind of the amount of stress that we put on tissues tend to respond in the direction of that stress. So if there's a lot of stress on the fascia, the fascia pulls the bone outward and this bony prominence here, so this little bump gets bigger. That's what we call a heel spur. So you might have went to a medical practitioner before who maybe took an x-ray of your foot and said, wow, you have some huge bone spurs. Those bone spurs are huge. No wonder you have heel pain. So I'm going to spoiler alert right now. The bone spur that you have on your foot is not causing your pain. Let me just repeat that in case you didn't hear that. The bone spur that you thought was causing your heel pain is not causing your heel pain. So there are still lots of runners that I see um, who have been told this information. So I just want to set the record straight and it is not the bone spur because how do we know that? So we know that because we can take x-rays on people who don't have any pain and they have huge bone spurs. The other thing is we have many people that we help with heel pain and they get better 
and we have not gone in and actually sawed off their bone to get rid of the bone spurs, but they get better. So if you've ever been told that you have a bone spur and you're basically screwed essentially and you can't run because you have these bone spurs, I want to tell you that that is fake news. <laughs> All right. So that, that is not true. Um, the bone spur will not limit your ability to run and it will not change your prognosis, meaning you can still get better. All right. So that's the good news. So I'm here to shed some good news for you. All right. So hopefully I clarified um, what the bone spur is and for you not to be scared of a bone spur. It really essentially doesn't mean much, tell you the truth. Okay. It's all about the tissues that are becoming inflamed and or degenerative. And that's the fascia. And that is what we're going to be talking about in this video. So what are the symptoms? How do you know if you have plantar fasciitis? So this is going to be that localized pain on the inside part of your heel, maybe extending into the arch area. That's it. It's not on the back of the heel, on the back of the heel bone. Then we usually start to look at Achilles tendonitis, tendinopathy, tendinosis, Achilles pain, or retrocalcaneal bursitis is in the back of the heel. So there's a little bursa back there. If you have this inflamed area that maybe you irritated against the heel counter of your shoe and you have a very rigid foot. So that is, again, it's more rare, but I have seen it in some runners where they get this redness and inflammation in the back of the heel. So today, what we're talking about is pain on the bottom of the foot, the bottom of the heel, very localized, right to that area. You have pain with the first step in the morning and after prolonged sitting at work. So you're sitting at work, you're sitting on the couch, watching that, stand up and walk, you're like, ooh, that's painful. You go to get out of bed in the morning and in your first couple of steps, you're like hobbling and your ankle, your foot's very stiff and it's painful. It eventually loosens up, but it does take some time. As the irritability gets worse, you have pain with prolonged standing. So now like those folks who are definitely standing most of their work day, if you're working in a restaurant, if you're working in a factory, if you're teaching all day, if you are treating patients all day, nurses, I see a lot of nurses with this condition, you guys are on your feet uh, most of your day. Um, that's when you're going to get your pain as well as with walking. So you might be walking your dog, walking with spouse, um, as I mentioned before. So this is pain during the beginning of the run, but then it eases up. So usually most folks are able to run, but then they have more pain after the run. So these are some of the symptoms that you'll get with plantar fasciitis. Um, some of the examination findings. So what is going to be positive? Like you go to a physical practitioner, what are some of the things that are what we call reproduce your pain? And that's how we kind of rule in if you have plantar fasciitis. One of the tests that we can do is actually stretch the fascia itself. Latoya, what's going on? Thank you for jumping on here on the live. Um, we can actually stretch that fascia by bending the toe back. So if you bend this toe, this is actually what we call the windlass mechanism in the foot, and it helps support your arch. So as you kind of bend this toe back, your arch actually raises up. So it helps support your arch. We need this toe extension when we run, when you walk as well. So when you run, you, when you walk, you need that toe extension. So we can do that wind last test. Sometimes that's limited, meaning it's stiff and it's tight and it could be painful. When we palpate, when we poke, right? We, we palpate in this area, we touch that spot and that's the spot that reproduces the pain. Other things that we'll find on exam commonly is that the ankle mobility is limited as well as decreased uh, muscle length. So you have tight, basically calf muscles, Achilles area, as well as the structures on the bottom of the foot. So the fascia itself, the soft tissue on the bottom of the foot can be limited. All right. And believe it or not, all of those I can pretty much assess with a uh, virtual video visit um, with someone. I can kind of be able to diagnose, coming up with the symptoms, asking the right questions, and then actually going through some of those tests via video, um, believe it or not. So Carly's, Car Carly's got a question here. So Carly's question is, my foot pain started as ankle pain and moved into my arch. Not sure if it could still be plantar fasciitis. 
Um, it may be Carly, but typically that is not the common presentation unless, again, your ankle pain started as an ankle limitation in motion. And this is something we could do with like a weight-bearing lunge test and seeing how much your ankle actually flexes. So you can like do a lunge, see if your knee hits the wall, and then compare it to the other side. If on the affected side, your ankle doesn't flex as much, that could indicate limited motion. And sometimes I'll see runners who have a stiff ankle, which can easily happen. It's very common in many runners, especially if you like did a hard hill workout um, where this ankle gets jammed. And then that can cause a little pain and stiffness in the ankle itself. And because that's limited now, and, and now your mechanics are different when you run, it puts extra stress on the fascia. So that's like actually getting down to like one of the root causes of what can cause plantar fasciitis. So the other possibility though, Carly, is especially if your ankle is painful on the inside part, most likely it's, it's probably more posterior tibialis tendonitis. So that's a little different tendon issue, um, which could occur, especially if you're a big overpronator and you have flatter arches. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, Jay Meyerson, thank you for jumping on here. Jay Meyerson will be here on the live in a couple of weeks next month. I uh, talked about that, buddy. I'm excited to have you on. <laughs> Jay Meyerson says the FBI. So looking at the foot posture index, yes. So foot posture index, what Jay's talking about is really looking at the structure of your foot. So we, we can look at things and we can even look at this via video visits as well, can't we, Jay? Um, and looking at the structure of someone's foot and seeing if they're at risk. So that's a perfect segue, Jay, because that really brings me to the next kind of phase is what causes plantar fasciitis. And one of the risk factors that can cause plantar fasciitis is too high of an arch. So here's our arch. If our arch is too high, you're what we call a chandelier shaker, or you're like not sneaking up on anyone, walking around your house barefoot, um, walking on your hardwood floors. Like if your spouse is always telling you, like, why do you have to walk so loud? Um, you're not sneaking up on anyone. Or you're in the opposite end of the spectrum, and you're a flat foot person. So your foot is like pancake flat. It's like flat on the ground. And you're like a ninja. You're like walking around your house like no one hears you coming. Um, you could sneak up on anyone because your feet are never like leaving the ground. They're constantly on the ground. So having too high of an arch or too low of an arch, those could both be detected with the aforementioned foot posture index that Jay Myerson just dropped in there. Um, other causes of plantar fasciitis are active adults. Us, right? Active adults ages 40 to 70. So pretty much most of the people who are listening to this, I know there's probably a couple of in their 30s, maybe you're even in your 20s. But if you're in your 20s, you're probably not having plantar fasciitis. So you're probably not listening to this right now. So you're probably in your 40s to 70s. Being a distance runner is actually a risk factor and could cause plantar fasciitis. So all again, all of you listening to this episode right now, um, being overweight is a risk factor. So maybe you did gain some pounds during COVID, right? Maybe you've recently um, gained some weight and now your foot's starting to hurt. That could be a risk factor. And doing some weight management strategies can also help take stress off of the fascia. We know that pregnancy is a risk factor. So this is a common condition that can happen in pregnant females. Um, also working at a standing job. So as I mentioned before, if you're standing all day for work, that's another risk factor. So nurses, restaurant workers, factory line workers, um, those that are standing all day. All right. So guys, as we're going along, please drop your question. All right. Lou's got a question for me. I love, love the questions. All right. I, I just, it just makes it a little more interactive. I like this. Um, so Lou says any ankle stability improvement advice, some fast racing shoes are bouncy, but that's more impact on the ankles, especially at the beginning of a run. Um, yes, Lou. So this will actually get into segue into treatment. So let's hold off on that. But in general, basically, to answer your question is really stability of your foot muscles as well as ankle stability. So the ankle muscles is a little different then plantar fasciitis. We're going to get into today's episode, the foot muscles and the ones that actually help stabilize the bottom of your foot. Um, so Latoya says, let's talk toes. Great toe joint pain. Yeah. So Latoya, good question. Um, just to clarify, again, another differential diagnosis 
if you guys are having pain underneath your toe, so your big toe, then that can be um, a couple of things. It could either be a stiff toe joint, so you could start to develop some early onset of arthritis in this joint if it's really stiff and limited in mobility, or you could get irritation of the sesamoid bones underneath the foot. So underneath that big toe, see these two little balls here? So those are actually uh, bones. So those are floating bones on the bottom of underneath your metatarsal here. And those can become irritated. Like I actually treated a bunch of dancers um, who would constantly have this condition. And I've seen a couple of runners who have had this as well, um, especially those that really transition to a like zero uh, heel drop and they change a lot of their pressures to the ball of their toe with their running and or they did a, a quick ramp up of trying to really be a heel striker and then transitioning to more of a forefoot or a toe striker. Um, so that that is first toe joint pain itself, Latoya, and that is definitely different from plantar fasciitis. So again, plantar fasciitis we're talking about tonight is going to be the heel. So that's going to give you that heel pain, first toe pain. So thank you for that clarification. Carly says, thanks. You're welcome, Carly. And uh, Laura says, I seem to have a migrating injury. Began as a heel spur, then Achilles, now posterior tib, and beginning on the outside of the ankle. The pain radiates like a burn. Are these all related? Wow. So, Laura, um, usually not, but it could be. Again, there is clearly some dysfunction going on in your body. And it sounds like you need a good evaluation of someone who's going to get down to the root cause of what is going on. Because it sounds like either... Your pain wasn't all of those, and it wasn't all those, and then you had something else going on, and possibly I would definitely recommend getting your lower back cleared and making sure it's not any radicular pain or radiating pain from your lumbar spine because those nerves go down into your foot and ankle. So that can easily refer pain down, as well as, especially since you mentioned burn, usually burning type pain is associated with nerves. So I would make sure that you get a good evaluation to rule out exactly what is going on and what your diagnosis is. And it sounds like regardless, in order to get better, you're going to need to really get down to the root cause of what is going on. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Lou says, thanks. You're welcome, Lou. And all right, guys. So let's get into, let's get into treatment, right? This is why you came. You want to know, how do I get rid of this thing? So hopefully you understand a little bit about what plantar fasciitis is, what are the causes, what are the symptoms, um, what are the risk factors, and let's get into five actionable tips. So this is actually going to be something that I presented over a year ago. I actually went back and watched this video on my YouTube channel uh, earlier today because I was thinking about, all right, I talked about plantar fasciitis before. This was before the podcast. So this is our first podcast episode talking about plantar fasciitis. But if you've been in the Healthy Runner Facebook group um, for a long time, you may have already heard this method before. And I just created this method last year, and I really thought about it. This is the structure and the foundation of how the runners that I work with were able to overcome this plantar fascia heel pain. And it's what I call the SPARK method. So for the SPARK method, what we're really going to do is share five tips. So SPARK is five letters. So we're going to go in order, starting with the S. And the first treatment, the first thing that we're going to address is stretching. So stretching, the focus of stretching um, is really going to be on that win-last mechanism I mentioned before and really results in the first toe and actually stretching the actual fascia. Now, if you've been following along on the podcast for a while, you know that my big focus is usually strengthening. And we've talked about that most folks are too hung up on stretching certain structures. And trust me, I will get into strengthening, but stretching in my mind in the beginning phases as long as it's not too aggressive, not increasing um, pain at all, a lot of times is what most folks need, especially if they're feeling that stiffness. And if you have been told to stretch, 
some runners that I come into contact with have been given like a little handout, maybe like two pictures by their doctor that have been to stretch their Achilles tendon. And they'll show me like a standard runner stretch to kind of stretch the calf. So that may be helpful if your calf muscle is tight. So if you have tight calves, then yes, that can be helpful. Um, however, the most important stretch, the one stretch, if you need to do one stretch, it is to stretch the plantar fascia. And how do we do that? We basically do that by crossing our leg over the other leg, grabbing our heel bone, bending our toes back, and adding a little massage to the bottom of the plantar fascia. So you can get your knuckle, dig in there. You can get your thumb to dig in. Massage that area in a stretch position. And that is what you need to do before you take that first step in the morning. Because when you're sleeping, most of us sleep with the sheets down and our ankles flexed like this. So if our ankle is flexed like this, then that fascia becomes tightened. And then we go to take that first step in the morning, we get out of bed, our body weight pushes down on our foot, splays down, and that causes the pain because now we're stretching that fascia that's been shortened all night. And then this causes that micro trauma, repetitive micro trauma, right at the connection point to the bone. And that's that either inflammation or if this has been happening for days, weeks, months, like it is for most of us, then that's causing that chronic degenerative changes to the actual fascia. So if you stretch it first before you put your weight on, then when you put your weight on, it's not going to be as painful and or it isn't going to be painful at all. So you want to work mobility. I even honestly will just even lying in bed, you can bend your toe back. And some of us are, you'll actually feel a little stretch by just laying down, bending your toes back and forth, almost like ankle pumps, and then cross your leg over and do that stretch. So those of you who are here on the live, you haven't seen the stretch before. If you type into the comment box, uh, one stretch, I will drop that link for you on how to actually stretch that sitting on the edge of your bed before you take that first step, as long as your bladder could wait. Not going to lie. Sometimes it can't, and I can't sit there and stretch for a while. Um, but I would honestly do that three to five times, maybe holding 10 to 15 seconds, massaging it into the fascia first. You're going to feel a lot better. And if you do have any type of supportive shoes um, or softer shoes or like um, slippers that are thicker cushioned, that might be better than you walking barefoot to the bathroom when you get out of bed in the morning. All right, so stretching the fascia, stretching the calf muscle, as well as stretching the Achilles tendon. So all of those structures will benefit from stretching. So that's tip number one. Um, so I do see that Kelly is there on Instagram. Unfortunately, Instagram won't allow me to drop a link, Kelly. So you're going to have to actually um, check this out on YouTube. And so watch the replay on YouTube after I post it uh, tomorrow or go into our Healthy Runner Facebook group and you'll be able to see the link drop there because um, I can't unfortunately drop links in Instagram Live. All right. So tip number two, here we go. P in Spark is going to be patience. So this condition, guys, there is no quick fix. There is no infomercial quick fix toy tool that you will buy and get rid of your pain. There is no cortisone injection that is going to instantly get rid of your pain and cure your condition. Could possibly a cortisone injection decrease pain for a little bit. Traditionally, most of the folks that I've seen, it really doesn't help in the long term. There are no gimmicks, okay? There's no single one thing. There's no tool. There's no taping technique that is going to get rid of your plantar heel pain. There is no brace. There is no orthotic. Those things may help on the margins. So, all right, let's get into this first off. Um, have you guys, those of you who are here on the live, let me know. Have you guys ever heard of kind of the analogy like you have a jar and you have large rocks, like you got boulders, you got like medium-sized rocks, you got some small rocks and you got some pebbles and maybe you got sand, right? You have all those elements and you're like, Okay, how do I fit all these elements into this one jar? Which one do you put in? Do you put in the large rocks, the boulders, or do you start with the sand? What do you think? Let me know. 
Drop it in the comment box. Let me know what you guys think. And uh, Kat, thank you so much for dropping that link for the one stretch. That's awesome. Man, I got some help with me here on the live today. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Andrea's here on the live. Thank you for tuning in, Andrea. Oh my goodness, on Instagram, we got the talented Will Boyd. Will, I saw your message. I will be getting back to you. Um, uh, we'll make something work out, but I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with you. We need to speak. We need to chat. Um, all right. So Kelly says the large ones. Anyone else knows which one's going first to fill all the elements inside the jar? How do we get all those elements inside the jar? We got the large ones or are we going with the sand first? We're going to start with sand. We're going to start with the, the little rocks. What do we think? What do we got, guys? All right. So Kelly is there for the win. So we start with these large rocks, and then you fit the smaller ones, and then you pour the sand in. So if you, if you guys could YouTube this video, right? If you're not sure what I'm talking about, you're listening on the podcast, and you're like, I have no clue what this guy is talking about. Uh, YouTube a video on what do you put in a jar first? Large rocks, small rocks, sand, and you'll be able to actually see this. So you start with the large rocks. So when we're talking about getting better from plantar fasciitis or heel pain, getting rid of it, we need to start with the large rocks. And that's what I'm covering here in these five tips for overcoming heel pain is the large rocks. These are what you want to spend the majority of your time addressing it's not going to be the next greatest taping technique. It's not going to be the gimmick that is going to get rid of your pain. Um, those things are on the margins and those things can be beneficial and might help out here and there. And we can get into some of that, but I really wanted to share with you, what are those large rocks? What are the boulders, right? These are the things that I've worked with many runners before and they work. So that's why I'm sharing them here with you. All right. So we had first tip was stretching. Second tip was patience. Third tip, we got to activate the deep foot muscles. So spark A, activation. We got to activate the deep foot muscles. So what am I talking about? So let me grab my model again. All right. So on the bottom of your foot, look at all those muscles. You got all those muscles on the bottom of your foot. We never think about those muscles, do we? We never do. So there are actually small stabilizing muscles. These muscles support your arch. So again, especially if you have that flat foot that we talked about earlier as being a risk factor, um, if you're really that flat foot person, then stabilizing, activating these deep foot muscles are going to help stabilize your foot and take pressure off of the fascia. So you're going to actually take pressure off of the fascia so you're not having that strain and those compressive forces and the kind of what we call the tensile load to the fascia. So how do we activate these deep foot muscles? We do that with a number of different activities. So we can do like a doming exercise where you actually dome your foot up like three points of contact. We also call it a short foot exercise. So if you envision, I'm going to try to describe this as best as possible listening on the podcast, um, you're going to think of three points of contact in your foot, the inside part of your heel, the ball of your big toe, and then the ball of your fifth toe. So it's like a tripod foot, we call it like three points of contact. And you want to think of your like making like a tent. So you're going to build up your arch without scrunching your toes. And that's the hard part. So those of you who are here on the live right now, try this. See if you can actually do this. Um, if you haven't tried this before, give it a whirl. Um, try to increase your arch height without scrunching your toes. And that will actually activate your deep stabilizer muscles. We call that your foot intrinsic muscles. So that is one exercise. Another exercise that you can do is what we call toe yoga. And it's actually holding your big toe down on the ground and then lifting your four other toes. And then you can lift your big toe and then you wind up lowering each toe one by one. So if you guys want to see the video of how to actually do these exercises, just type in toe yoga into the comment box and I will drop the kind of foot stabilization exercises. It's actually a video that I did of a dancer because they have a lot of foot and ankle pain as well. But I give it to all my runners as well. So this will be great for you to do to help stabilize the bottom of your foot. And this is what I was talking about to you before, Lou, when you were asking about that stability. If you go to 
like more of a, a less cushioning shoe. Um, so I just need to like give a shout out right now, guys, to my daughters. So this is the first time I'm doing this live on Instagram as well as we're on Facebook, as we're doing the podcast episode. And both of my daughters just jumped on Instagram right now. So I got to give a shout out to them. What's up, Liv? What's up, Gabby? My daughter, Olivia, she's always saying, oh, hey. Oh, hey, what's up? Uh, Gabby says, hey, as well. And so Kelly's got a question about how um, you don't get foot cramping when doing this exercise. How don't you get foot cramping? Good question. Yeah, so usually you get foot cramping if those muscles aren't trained enough. So that's usually a sign that you need to work on those muscles. So one thing that I would do to prevent the cramping or um, is stretch it first. So you do that one stretch first, stretch the fascia. And we didn't talk about that before, but in addition to stretching, you can also put a golf ball underneath your foot in the arch area. You can roll the bottom of it. They make those little foot rollers with little knobs on them. I have them like all over my house, right? The girls will be able to tell you guys. I got one in my office area. I got one in the bathroom to do in the morning um, after I do hobble over to go brush my teeth. So you can actually massage that out with one of those foot rollers in between doing that foot doming stabilization exercises. So hopefully that was helpful for you. And going back to Facebook here, Diane says the boulders, cat's got the large boulders. Um, Cecilia, I will get you that link for the uh, toe yoga, uh, the foot stabilization exercises. Um, Lou says toe yoga sounds fun. Yes, Lou, you will enjoy toe yoga. Um, Michelle says toe yoga. So I will get you guys that link um, after I'm through here. So that is the third tip. Um, the other thing I actually wanted to mention with that is activation of those foot muscles are especially important. And I think like Lou was on a good point before is sometimes we have too much stability. And I shared this actually in episode 39 of the podcast when I gave my 10 tips to improve your race time and run faster. I talked about during this crazy year of COVID how I actually started working out of my house for three months barefoot with the goal of activating those deep foot muscles. And then I was able to actually wean out of my orthotics for my workouts. And like this morning, this morning I did all of my strength training on one leg and all of my strength training for me to do as a runner without orthotics on because I was able to activate those deep foot muscles. So start out by activating them. And then the goal is to actually use them when you are standing, when you're training on one leg. So then they're stronger when you're running on one leg. So consider that is if you're always in supportive shoes, you're always in orthotics. Can you spend time out of your orthotics and actually work on stabilizing those muscles so they can support and take stress off of the arch. So that's where some of the rationale comes into play for those that were into barefoot running. Um, I am more in the of barefoot training, meaning not running, but actually strength training and doing different exercises on one leg to train your body in that fashion. All right, so let's get to the fourth tip. So this is going to be the R in spark. The R in spark there is going to stand for not rest. No, 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 not rest, but resistance training, meaning strength training, meaning we need to do weight bearing progressions and loading to the fascia. So this is more of a fascia loading program that you need to do in order to start to load it up and actually cause those changes so it can heal those degenerative changes that we were talking about before. So those can heal and they can get a lot, kind of stimulate that healing process so the tissue heals and it's not as painful. So these are specific exercises. I actually have four exercises to work on this weight bearing progression that I put together on my YouTube channel. So if you want that video, just type in fascia loading program and I'll get you the weight bearing progressions. I think it's kind of titled four stretches um, for plantar fasciitis, but it's basically starting to load the fascia. So you're stretching it and loading it. And guys, if you've been following along, this sounds very similar to what we talked about hamstring tendinopathy in our hamstring tendinopathy episode. So we need to load tissues, especially these chronic conditions that have been going on for a while. And then also don't forget to strengthen the Achilles 
the calf muscles, your hamstrings, and your glutes. So all of those muscles that are in the back part of your leg, they function together when we run. We call that the kind of posterior chain or sling in the back of your leg. And if there's weakness from up above, that energy is going to transfer down to your foot and put more stress to the fascia. All right. So fourth tip is going to be resistance training. So we're not only stretching, but we're also strengthening. All right. We got strength training in order to run. So just kind of recapping for what I just covered or no, we're not going to do that yet. Let's finish. Let's finish our five tips here. Let's stay focused. All right. The fifth tip is going to be fifth tip is going to be the K in spark. What's that going to stand for? The K in spark is going to be to keep running. Wait, if I have plantar fasciitis, I've been told to rest. I've been told to not run because that's what's causing my plantar fasciitis. No, the running is not causing your plantar fasciitis. Other things are causing your plantar fasciitis. So the key to getting better as a runner with this condition is what we call activity modification. So you need to modify your running, not stop. So I've had this now for, let's see, I've had this condition because I actually made this video. I I looked at it. It was like 14 months ago and I talked about having it for months. So right now, uh, technically I have been battling with plantar fasciitis for 18 months right now. So it is at such a low level, like I would literally give it a one out of 10 pain, but I do feel it at times. And I know if I don't do my exercises that I mentioned in this episode, then it feels a lot worse. So I kind of, I'm living proof that this takes a while, you need patience and that you can actually keep running with this. So it hasn't limited my running. And I was actually able to run my fastest half marathon in four years, even though I've been managing this condition for the last 18 months. So this is something that, again, you don't need to stop running. And we talked about this in episode 36, where we talked about three reasons you should not stop running when you have an injury. So if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to that episode. I got in depth into you lose your running fitness, you get weaker, your muscles atrophy away, and you also get stiffer. So those are three reasons to not stop running. So I would highly encourage you to modify your running and work with a good running rehab professional who can guide you back in to being able to run and also get better at the same time. So hopefully that makes sense. So another question that I really get from a lot of folks who have this condition and let me just catch up on comments here. Um, So Diane says, how does the dome exercise work with already high arches? Great question, Diane. Um, That is, usually you may not need that. You could, if your arch is so high and it's already like supported itself, you're really not going to go through any range of motion necessarily, but you might still get some activation of those deep foot muscles. So So try the exercise, see if you feel those muscles kicking in and like tension on the bottom of your foot. If so, I would say that's a good thing to do. If not, then you will not need that. It is classically more for that flatter arch over pronator uh, runner. Um, So Andrea says, I love the football when at my standing desk. Yes, absolutely, Andrea. I got a little rolling thing right under my standing desk every time I go to stand up. Roll the right side, roll the left side, um, does wonders. And Kat, thank you so much for dropping that um, exercise. That's awesome. Um, That is the one. Yes, you are correct. Those are the four stretches. Thank you so much. So that is the weight-bearing progression that Kat just dropped there on Facebook. I appreciate that. Um, So what kind of orthotic do you recommend, Melanie asked? Great question. Melanie, the true answer is um, the right orthotic for you. So there are many different types of orthotics. There are orthotics, off-the-shelf, semi-custom, which literally in the research has been shown to be as effective for runners um, as custom orthotics. However, for someone who has fitted custom orthotics for most of my career, I am more of a believer in seeing results with custom foot orthotics. However, they are pretty pricey. So depending upon, you know, what you're willing to invest and if you've 
addressed all the other factors that we've talked about in this episode, then orthotics may or may not be for you. They can help decrease pain, we know, and decrease stress, whether or not in the long term they're a good thing for you. Don't just think of the orthotic as a quick fix, though. Okay, think of it in combination with other um, treatments that we talked about in this episode. So, unfortunately, it really depends. It's like that answer that we hate to get, don't we? Um, it does depend upon which orthotic you recommend. If you do have a higher arch, I would say the goal of an orthotic is not to build your arch up, but it's almost to like just support your arch. So you, it tricks your foot into thinking it's hitting the ground flat. Those that have, high, have higher arches, their gait pattern, so their running pattern is a little different than, than someone who is an overpronator. So they wind up like reversing their gait cycle essentially. So when they're basically pronating, they're supinating, they're basically increasing their arch height, and then they're pushing off of a unstable or floppy foot as opposed to the other way around, which is what your foot should do when you are running. Um, so hopefully that was helpful um, to you. So you're cur currently wearing custom, but yes, pricey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then you have to remember with your custom orthotics, you will need a refurbishment every two to three years. The materials do uh, break down. So you do need to build those back up and refurbish those um, orthotics as you go. So don't forget about that because that can make a difference in your symptoms. So guys, a question I get commonly is what is the best exercises for plantar fasciitis? So let's just recap kind of what we talked about in these five tips. If I had to give you five exercises, um, it's going to be stretching the fascia. It's going to be stretching the Achilles tendon and the calf muscle. It's going to be deep foot stability exercises like the foot doming or short foot exercise and that toe yoga I was mentioning. Fourth, it's going to be a weight bearing, stretching, and loading program for the fascia itself. And again, that is progressive. That is not like go to town, day one, kill yourself, no pain, no gain. It needs to be progressive in nature. And that's where, again, having a medical practitioner take you through is, can be beneficial. And then don't forget fifth about Achilles calf strength and endurance. So do you guys know that you should be able to perform 25 heel raises on each leg. So you should be able to perform 25. So standing on one leg, rising up and down on your toe, you should be able to do that 25 times. Did you know that? If you didn't, see if you can do it. Stand on one leg, rise up and down, good control, full range of motion, keep your knees straight, don't bend your knee, and see if you can do 25 on each leg. If you can't, then your endurance of your calf muscles limited. That's going to put extra stress down below on the fascia. So work that um, calf muscle, work the endurance of your calf muscle. I have some great exercises. You know what my new favorite one is? Let's drop this link because I've never done this. Um, I've never shared this link with you guys before. But my new favorite one to do in the gym now, and this I started when I was doing my um, in-home workouts for runners during uh, lockdown and COVID, was putting a dumbbell or a kettlebell on your thigh and doing a calf raise. So one foot's elevated on a bench or a step or your sofa, and you're rising up on that foot, and then you do a calf raise on the opposite foot. So the beauty of it, one knee is bent, so it works your soleus muscle, the deeper calf muscle, and the other leg is straight, so it works your gastroc. So it works the, the bigger muscle on the outside of your calf. So that's my like new favorite exercise. Um, so if you want that calf exercise, can you just put in the comment box, um, kettlebell calf exercise or kettlebell calf, and I'll know what you're talking about. And I will uh, drop the link, uh, for that exercise because that's like my new favorite. Um, and I want to share that one with you guys, um, uh, because I think you'll really enjoy it and you'll be able to get the benefit of strengthening both of your calf muscles. So those would be the five exercises, um, that I would recommend for, curing plantar fasciitis. So before we wrap up this episode, guys, for those of you who are here on the live, if you have any other questions, feel free, drop them into the comment box. So Kelly says here on Instagram are the very first symptoms warning signs. Um, Kelly is you have heel, heel pain and it feels stiff. You, you step first thing in the morning, you're feeling pain and it maybe goes away after like five steps, but eventually with each passing day, it gets a little bit worse you get more pain, it gets stiffer. Um, those are the early warning signs. 
So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that helped you. Um, so one of the questions that was actually asked from the previous um, post that I did on today's episode was Angela Taylor asked if, why do I feel like my plantar fasciitis is getting better and then worse again? So will my foot ever be quote unquote normal again? She says that she's doing single leg weighted calf raises, three sets, eight reps each side, two to three times a week. Should I be doing other exercises too? So great question, Angela. And the reason why I did share this on this episode is because I feel like there, you are not alone. There are many runners with this condition, as I mentioned before, that have this pain. I've had it for a long time. I've been working at it, right? Doing these things. And I have talked to many runners who are not doing those things. And it is very frustrating and it keeps, it will feel better for a little bit and then it gets worse again. So that's not uncommon. That's not uncommon. So again, you have to have patience, which was my second tip, right? The P, patience. You got to have patience and your foot will be normal again. It just takes time and you need to do the strategies I talked about in this episode. So you need to make sure you, number one, address the root cause why you're having this. So is it a mobility issue? Is it a stability issue? And then you need to consistently, just like you've been doing with your calf raises, So that's awesome that you're doing the weighted calf raises. I would just make sure also that the endurance of your calf muscle is up to par because you're basically doing strengthening because you're doing a lower rep range. So eight reps, you're basically doing strengthening three times a week. So I like to alter and do one day of endurance training for the calf muscle. So go higher rep range, maybe do 20, 25 reps with your knee straight. And then in, in your second, and set, try to do 20 to 25 reps with your knee bent, or try that other exercise that I just mentioned for to kind of hit the gastroc and the soleus muscle in your calf. So that should be definitely helpful for you, um, as well as you definitely need to be doing some foot stability exercise. So the toe yoga that I mentioned, as well as the weight bearing progression loading. That's key, honestly, is the loading progression of the fascia. That is going to be key. So if you add those in, Angela, I am convinced that you will start seeing some more progressive improvement in your condition. So thank you so much for dropping your question in the promo post. I um, appreciate that. So uh, Latoya says, ouch, calf raises. Did you just try 25 of those, Latoya? Um, So Gene says the kettlebell calf. Uh, Shauna says the kettlebell calf. You'll get that. And Kat, man, you are good, Kat. Thank you so much. I think you found it. I believe it is that video. It should be. Um, I'm sure it is. But thank you so much for dropping. And consistency with the exercises is is key as well, Gene mentions. And Michelle says, working those calves now. Awesome, Michelle. I'm so glad you are incorporating, getting things done, taking action. That's what it's all about. So, guys, I can share, like, this information with you. But if you don't take action, like Michelle's doing, you're not going to get better. Right? So, let me just recap what we covered Or no, I'll give you my final stretch first. So final stretch of every episode, I'm going to share with you the one misconception about plantar fasciitis. What would that be? It takes time to heal and you need to stay consistent with the plan that I outlined. So there are no band-aids. There are no quick fixes for this condition. So the recap of what we covered in this episode, we covered what is plantar fasciitis We covered, how do I know if I have plantar fasciitis? What are the symptoms? We covered what causes plantar fasciitis? How do I get rid of it? What is the treatment? What is the best exercise for plantar fasciitis? And how do we prevent it from starting? Or how do we prevent it from coming back, right? And the key to preventing it from coming back, guys, is really the rehab becomes the prehab, meaning The exercise that I talked about will help get rid of your plantar fasciitis, but it's also going to help it from coming back in the future. So I hope that makes sense to you. Um, If you are a runner that's been trying to stay healthy and you can't train because heel pain is stopping you from meeting your goals and you're worried that your foot injury will limit you from doing what you love, like working out and being able to train, um, have you wondered what it will cost you in the long run if you continue to train through pain, 
Will you have to stop running totally? Um, are you going to lose the confidence that you built up, lose your mojo, lose that ability for you to get rid of all that mental stress that uh, stress that running provides? Um, have you seen other medical professionals or providers in the past that just tell you to stop running? So I have a unique uh, treatment approach that focuses on solving these problems with the runners I work with at Spark Physical Therapy, whether it's our in-person um, sessions right here in my clinic or virtually through video sessions, we get down to the of your problem and provide you with the structure of a guided supervised exercise program as well as a return to run program to help you get stronger pain-free and perform at your peak to get you back on the road doing what you love so my goal is to help keep you active and on the road while recovering from your injury by guiding you in ways to modify your training rather than eliminating running so if this is you let's chat let's jump on a call and see if you're a good fit for how i help runners just head over to sparkyourtraining.com, all one word, and hit the inquire about availability and cost button, and I will give you a call. So if you guys like this episode of the podcast and you're new to the podcast and you have other um, injuries, you have other aches and pains, then you're probably going to want to check out other episodes that I've done a deep dive, just like I did today, kind of telling you about the injury, how do you prevent it, how do you fix it, and how do you prevent it from coming back. So episode 20 was all about IT band pain syndrome, so iliotibial band syndrome. Episode 24 of the podcast was all about proximal hamstring tendinopathy, so that top of the hamstring pain Episode 33 was all about runner's knee or those achy knees, that kneecap pain. So if you have any of those, check out those episodes. Um, you'll get to learn a lot about those conditions and how to actually get rid of them. And so you can continue to run without having that stubborn pain. So if you guys have found this talk helpful, please hit the like, hit the love button here on Facebook, here on Instagram. Thank you guys for jumping on the Instagram live. By the way, if this was helpful, let me know. Uh, let me know if I should do more of this during the lives. Unfortunately, I can't do it when I'm on doing my Zoom interviews with guests. But for when I go solo, I'll be happy to jump on here on Instagram if you guys think it's helpful. Um, so on Facebook, guys, give me give me a little love. Give me a little hearts. Um, <laughs> Latoya says that Kat, you are a rock star. She is a rock star, isn't she? Um, she had them on her favorites list because you had them do them part of your home exercises. Yes. And you did do them and you got better, didn't you, Kat? Um, so thank you guys so much, uh, for helping out today, dropping a lot of those video links. I'm going to sign off here on Instagram because I think the video is probably going to end. So thanks for tuning in Instagram and I'm hitting end there. And guys, also, if you are listening to the podcast, um, and this was helpful for you, please share this episode with a friend who needs some help with their running, who's always complaining that their foot hurts every time you go out for a run or they're complaining they can't run eight miles because their foot's going to hurt. So hopefully this information can help them out. And I also want to give a special shout out to the future healthy runner who's going to listen to this episode or this video either within our healthy runner Facebook group in the topics tab. You might go to Monday Night Spark and be like plantar fasciitis. I've, I've had this. Let me listen to this video. Um, or you join the group. So a lot of times you guys join the group and you, you tell me, you know, what's been going on with your foot. Um, you've having foot pain. I'll drop this video. So kudos to you for watching this in the future. Future Healthy Runner, thank you so much for watching. If you caught the replay, type in hashtag team replay. Let me know that you caught this. And I appreciate you listening to it. And I hope it's helpful for you. And those of you who caught this on our Spark Your Training YouTube channel, thank you so much for watching. And remember, guys, every Monday night, 8 p.m., we go live within the Healthy Runner Facebook group. So keep us in mind in your schedule so you can get your running questions answered. Thanks again, guys. Stay active, stay healthy, and just keep running. Until next time. Bye, guys.